Welcome back to a brand new session from the teaching series on divine healing. If you remember in the last few sessions, we started uh, the second big chapter about God's will and God's heart on healing. And we discussed so far a, a few subsections. Why did Jesus heal when he was on earth? And we found out that it was mainly about compassion. Then we discussed about the uh, uh, healing as the will of God in the Old Testament, then healing is included in redemption. And we finished last time on the section, same works as Jesus. And today we're continuing with the fifth subsection from this big chapter entitled Anything, Anyone, Anytime, Anywhere. This is a favorite motto of me when it comes to divine healing. Uh, anything, any sickness for anyone, anytime, anywhere. Jesus healed any kind of disease on anyone, anytime, and anywhere. Don't you like that? Isn't that good news? God doesn't have any disclaimers. He doesn't put any qualifiers. He says any sickness, any disease for anyone. If, if doesn't matter if you're in the family of God or not, if you are in the kingdom or not, for anyone, anytime, anywhere. You don't need an atmosphere for miracles. You don't need to be in a certain geographical place or city to experience the healing of God. The healing of God is a free gift of any sickness, any disease for any person, no matter how much you sin, no matter what, what you did, anytime, anywhere. I love that. So let's begin today with a, a first verse, a first passage from Mark 16, verses 15 to 18. I'll be reading from the New King James versions, but you are welcome to use any English version that you have available. Let's read it together. And he said to them, go into all the world and preach the gospel to every creature. He who believes and is baptized will be saved, but he who does not believe will be condemned. And these signs will follow those who believe. In my name they will cast out demons, they will speak with new tongues, they will take up serpents, and if they drink anything deadly, it will by no means hurt them. They will lay hands on the sick and they will recover. Amen. This is a powerful verse and passage that I think it's known by many Christians. And it's, uh, it's one of my favorites. But let's take a, look, a closer look to this passage. It says this, that these signs will follow. It's a certainty. These signs will follow, not might follow. They will follow the believers. Jesus, as I said in the beginning, Jesus makes such blank statements with no qualifications whatsoever. I like that about God. I love that about God. He's, he didn't say here that the, these signs will follow if you're good enough or if you fast enough or if you pray enough or if you tie enough. None of that. These signs will follow you no matter if you did, this, if you did those things or not or if you have a sin in your life or you don't have a sin in your life. The only requirement, the only condition, he only said if you believe. That's the only condition. We don't need to add any other condition. If you believe, this is the only condition. And he didn't say either if you're called to this sort of thing. You know, I hear so many Christians say, I'm called to this or I'm called to that. He didn't say if you're called. He said, if you are a believer, these signs will follow you. And again, you hear other people say, oh, that's not my ministry. Oh, it is your ministry. This is a common ministry for all believers. This is not a special calling or a special ministry for someone. I know that in the past, God worked and gave gifts to people, to certain people, anointed certain people, and they function in healing. But healing is not only for certain anointed people. God did that out of mercy for us, out of love for us. But he expects every believer, every Christian. This is a ministry for every believer in the body of Christ. For every Christian. It is the ministry of Jesus Christ. What he did, we need to do also. We should do also. Isn't that exciting? Let's continue with another passage from Matthew 
4, 23, 25. We're proving here that God wants to heal any sickness for anyone, anytime, anywhere. Matthew 4, 23, 25. And Jesus went about all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease among the people. Then his fame went throughout all Syria, and they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments, and those who were demon-possessed, epileptics and paralytics, and he healed them. Great multitudes followed him from Galilee and from Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and beyond Jordan. Have you seen this in verse 23? Healing all kinds of sicknesses and all kinds of diseases among the people. I love those words. All, all kinds of of sicknesses and he didn't stop there all kinds of diseases all kinds of handicaps and then he continued not only that not only physical healing like physical healing like or a bodily sickness but he continued saying they brought to him all sick people who were afflicted with various diseases and torments and those who were demon possessed epileptics paralytics and he healed them, all of them. The Bible doesn't say anywhere that where Jesus went, there was someone remaining or someone was left unhealed. They were all healed. That's good news. And one more passage here, Matthew 9, 35. There are so many of them. I just picked a few of them. Matthew 9, 35. Then Jesus went about all the cities and villages. See, no geographical space, no ge special geographical place teaching in their synagogues, preaching the gospel of the kingdom, and healing every sickness and every disease among the people. See here, here the Bible replaces all with every. Every sickness and every disease among the people. Amen. There's, there was no sickness too difficult for Jesus to heal. And this is our mandate as Christians too. This is our mandate to heal all kinds, every sickness, every disease. And as Christians, we don't specialize in certain sicknesses or certain ministries. We don't need, we generalize, we don't specialize. We generalize, why? That's because the solution is always the same for any problem. Sickness, torment, demon-possessed, epileptic, paralysis. What is the solution? I, I said it earlier in a, in a previous session. It's the life of God. It's the life of the Spirit. It's the new spirit in us, the new heart, the new recreated spirit, and which is one with the Holy Spirit. And it's energy, it's power, it's quantum power that flows out of us through our hands. That's why Mark 16 says to lay our hands over sick people and they'll recover. Because through our hands, the power of God flows. The life of God flows from our innermost being. Rivers of living water, rivers of life. Who, which, which bring healing to people and to ourselves. That's so exciting. Get out of this religious language and vocabulary. The spiritual life is real. It's power in, the, in, in God. Hallelujah. Let's read one more passage from Matthew 10, 1, where it says this. And when he had called his 12 disciples to him, he gave them power over unclean spirits to cast them out and to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. This is another passage from Matthew where it says again, heal all, he gave now to his apostle to heal all kinds of sickness and all kinds of disease. Matthew 10, 8. This is my favorite verse and I, I memorized it and you should do it too. And I personalize it. I declare it over myself. It says this, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out demons. Freely you have received, freely give. See, you have received something when you became born again. And when you became a Christian, you received something freely. You received power. You received healing. And he says, freely give. This is the ministry of all Christians, not for pastors, not for teachers, not only for teachers, not for apostles or prophets or evangelists, not only for them. It's for anyone. 
to walk in the fullness of Christ and to heal people. And Jesus sent his disciples here to, sin, to, to heal exactly like him. Every kind of sickness, every kind of disease. And that was before the cross. Can you imagine that? All the more after the cross. After Jesus died and paid on the cross for our healing. We, have, we are sent in the same way after the cross. Mark 9 verses 14 to 23 says this. And when he came to the disciples, he saw a great multitude around them and scribes disputing with them. Immediately when they saw him, all the people were greatly amazed and running to him greeted him. And he asked the scribes, what are you discussing with them? Then one of the, uh, one of the crowd answered and said, teacher, I brought you my son and, who has a mute spirit and wherever it seizes him, it throws him down. He thongs at the mouth, gnashes his teeth, and becomes rigid. So I spoke to your disciples that they should cast it out, but they could not. He answered that him and said, O faithless generation, how long shall I be with you? How long shall I bear with you? Bring him to me. Then they brought him to him, and when he saw him, immediately the spirit convulsed him, and he fell on the ground and wallowed, foaming at the mouth. So he asked his father, how long has he been happening? How long has this ha been happening to him? And he said, from childhood. And often he has thrown him, him both, often he has thrown him both into the fire and into the water to destroy him. But if you can do anything, have compassion on us and help us. Jesus said, if you can believe, all things are possible to him who believe. Here is the case of a demon-possessed child and a sick boy who could not be delivered by the disciples. And immediately we take this passage and say, see, even the disciples couldn't, couldn't uh, heal anyone, everyone and everywhere. But not, not yet. Let's take a closer look. In this context, Jesus says in verse 23 that all things are possible to him who believes. So if, if it didn't work for disciples, what happened? Actually, Jesus says in verse 19, faithless generation. Again, he didn't say you didn't fast enough, you didn't pray enough, you have too much sin, or you didn't do that and that. He says you didn't have faith. All things are possible to those who believe. If things didn't happen, if things were not moving, it means you didn't believe or you believe your, or your belief was weak. Your faith was weak. You had too much doubt, too much unbelief, which blocked, stopped the healing flowing through from you. And what, Jesus, what did Jesus do? He healed the, the boy. So that shows that any, God's will is for anything, anyone, anytime, anywhere. Jesus didn't say, oh, this is too difficult. We cannot do this. I mean, this is a special case. Oh, the, you disciples, you are right. I mean, I sent you to do something, but I forgot about this exception. No, the problem was with the disciples. The problem wasn't with God. It, the problem wasn't with God's will or God's heart to heal that boy. The problem was with the disciples. They had too much doubt. And I, I think it's not by coincidence that the Bible mentions so many outward signs that this boy was manifesting. Like he was foaming, he was gnashing his teeth, he was becoming rigid, he was uh, shouting, he, would, he was throw, throwing himself down into the fire. So I think when they saw all this, they panicked. And they immediately got doubt in their hearts and that blocked the healing and blocked the deliverance power to flow to that boy. But Jesus says that all things are possible to those who believe. Luke 4 verse 14 says this. When the sun was setting, all those who had any that were sick with various diseases brought them to him. And he laid his hands on every one of them and healed them. I'm taking all these passages to persuade you, to convince you from the word of God. And I'm not the one persuading you. I'm just telling you the truth from the Bible. The Holy Spirit in you, the inner witness convinces you. And the truth has a certain ring to it when you hear it. 
the Holy Spirit in you testifies. This is truth. This is the word. So I'm taking all these passages to persuade your mind that healing is for anyone. It says that everyone Jesus laid his hands on were healed. Everyone. There was no sickness, no demon possession too difficult for Jesus to heal. Let's continue. Uh, let's continue and read one more verse. Luke 6. We read Luke 4. Now Luke 6, two chapters later, verses 17 to 19. And he came down with them and stood on a level place with a crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea and Jerusalem and from the sea coast of Tyre and Sidon, who came to hear him and be healed of their diseases, as well as those who were tormented with unclean spirits, and they were healed. I love that phrase. And the whole multitude sought to touch him, for power went out from him and healed them all. Again, healed them all. Jesus didn't even have to lay his hands specifically on people. They were touching him without even him noticing everyone. But power was coming out of him and healing all. None, none remained sick. When Jesus was passing by, when Jesus went to a place, none, none of the people remained sick. They were all healed. Luke 9 verse 11, two chapters, three chapters later. But when the multitudes knew it, they followed him and he received them and spoke to them about the kingdom of God. The kingdom of God. Why? Because Jesus was speaking the kingdom and then manifesting the kingdom. The kingdom is healing. Healing is included in the kingdom. It's the protocol of the kingdom. So he was telling, spoke to them about the kingdom of God and healed those who had need of healing. See his, his ministry. He spoke, he taught them about the kingdom, and then he showed them the kingdom. He showed them what the kingdom is all about. So he healed all those who had the need of healing. They were cured regardless, regardless of the person, regardless of the time or location. This is so powerful. And the passage here, again, doesn't mention any qualifications for the people that were cured, like not having sins or having enough faith. Jesus didn't expect, he didn't check them. Do, uh, do you have sin in your life? Do you ha uh, have you, have you sanctified yourself? Or he didn't check, do you have enough faith? He healed them with his faith. He didn't ask them about their sins. He didn't ask them about their holiness. He just healed them. He showed them his love. He showed them the kingdom, the power of the kingdom. John 5 verses 1 to 15. I love the word of God. After this, there was a feast of the Jews and Jesus went up to Jerusalem. Now there, there is in Jerusalem by the sheep gate a pool, which is called in Hebrew Bethesda, having five porches. In these lay a great multitude of sick people, blind, lame, paralyzed, waiting for the moving of the water. For an angel went down at a certain time into the pool and stirred up the water. Then whoever, stop here for a moment, then whoever stepped in first, stepped in first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. Whoever, whatever. Now a certain man was there who had an infirmity 30 year, 38 years. When Jesus saw him lying there and knew that he already had been in that condition a long time, he said to him, do you want to be made well? The sick man answered him, sir, I have no man to put me into the pool when the water is stirred up. But while I am coming, another steps down before me. Jesus said to him, rise, take up your bed and walk. And immediately the man was made well, took up his bed and walked. And that day was the Sabbath. The Jews therefore said to him who was cured, it is the Sabbath. It, does, it is not lawful for you to carry your bed. He answered them. He who made me well said to me, take up your bed and walk. Then they asked him, who is the man who said to you, take up your bed and walk? But the one who was healed did not know who it was, for Jesus had withdrawn a multitude being in that place. Afterward, Jesus found him in the temple and said to him, see, you have been made well. Sin no more, lest the worst thing come upon you. 
the man departed and told the Jews that it was Jesus who had made him well. See, Jesus healed him first. He didn't care about his life, about his sins. And after that, he said, sin no more. But with love, he healed, I healed you. Sin no more that something worse might not come again. Something less, less the worst thing come upon you. See what I said in the beginning, that if you continue to do, to have a sinful lifestyle, not because of sin itself, I'm talking about um, damaging or destructive habits and patterns that affect your body, then something worse can come upon you. Another sickness can come upon you. So Jesus, with love, encouraged him to go and sin no more. But let's let's go back to the to the pool of the Bethesda. The angel was coming down at a certain time, which in this year coincided with the feast of the Jews, and that was the Passover. He would come down every Passover, enter the water and play. The the angel would play in the water. He would stir up the water. Try to picture it for a moment. The angel would come. Nobody would see anything, but the water would start moving and uh, would be stirred. Suddenly, you you see the the water moving, but you don't see the angel. Verse 4 says this, that whoever stepped first after the stirring of the water was made well of whatever disease he had. God doesn't care who you are or what you have done or what you have. To him is whoever and whatever. Beside the condition to to be first in the water, that was the condition to be first in the water. There was no other condition whatsoever. The only condition was to be first in the water. See how God is? He didn't... There was not any other condition like unforgiveness in your heart, lack of faith, lack of fasting, your social status, sinful actions and habits in your life, etc., etc. All these things we put on people and we say, oh, you cannot be healed. Oh, there's something in your life. Oh, God has a plan for you. No, God wants to heal you, wants to heal anyone regardless of all these things because he loves people and the Lord will heal anyone of anything. That's so exciting. So this is the, I'm closing here this subsection where I talked about anything to anyone, anytime, anywhere. And I hope that ministered to your heart. And we're moving to the sixth subchapter of this big section entitled, The Disciples Did the Same Thing. So Jesus did it. And now the disciples did the same thing that Jesus did. Let's see that where where they did that. And maybe you tell yourself, well, Jesus did it, but that's not for me. Jesus did it, but it's not for me. Let's look at how his disciples healed after Jesus ascended to heaven. So not not while Jesus lived on earth, but after Jesus left the earth. What the disciples did. And Acts chapter 5 verses 15 to 16. The Bible says this. So that, they, so that they brought the sick out into the streets and laid them on beds and couches that at least the shadow of Peter passing by might fall on some of them. Also a multitude gathered from the surrounding cities to Jerusalem bringing sick people and those who were tormented by unclean spirits and they were all healed. So it's not just Jesus. And see here a new thing that Jesus didn't do. Peter was healing people just with his shadow. Remember the great word we are called to do the same works that Jesus and I was saying, at least the same works Jesus do. But the Bible says that we will do greater works. And now Peter does a greater work. Only his shadow passed over the sick people and they were healed. And I like that the Bible says in verse 16, not that some were healed, but he says they were all healed. So the disciples did the same thing that Jesus did after Jesus left the earth. Let's analyze also the healing of the layman from the gate of the temple in Acts chapter 3 verses 1 to 16. Let's read it together. Now Peter and John went up together to the temple at the hour of prayer, the ninth hour. And a certain man laying from his mother's womb was carried, whom they laid daily at the gate of the temple, which is called Beautiful to ask alms from those who enter the temple. Who seeking, seeing Peter, who seeing Peter and John about to go into the temple, asked for alms. And fixing his eyes on him with John, Peter said, look at us. 
So he gave them his attention, expecting to receive something from them. Then Peter said, Silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you. In the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, rise up and walk. And he took him by the right hand and lifted him up, and immediately his feet and ankle bones received strength. So he, leaping up, stood and walked and entered the temple with them, walking, leaping, and praising God. And all the people saw him walking and praising God. Then they knew that it was he who sat begging alms at the beautiful gate of the temple, and they were filled with wonder and amazement at what had happened to him. Now as the lame man who was healed held on, the, uh, held on to Peter and John, all the people ran together to them in the porch, which is called Solomon's, greatly amazed. So when Peter saw it, he responded to the people, Men of Israel, why do you marvel at this? Or why look so intently at us as though by our own power or godliness we had made this man walk? The God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of our fathers, glorified his servant Jesus, whom you delivered up and denied in the presence of Pilate when he was determined to let him go. But you denied the Holy One and the just and asked for a murderer to be granted to you and killed the Prince of Life whom God raised from the dead, of which we are witnesses. And his name, through faith in his name, has made this man strong, whom you see and know. Yes, the faith which comes through him has given him this, perf this perfect soundness in the presence of you all. Let's take a look at verses 1 to 3 above and see that these verses show us that Peter and John were going to the temple to pray. They knew the power and the need of prayer. But here they were going, and they were going regular to pray, but here they were not yet prayed up. They met the layman before they prayed, before they got into the temple to pray, to have a chance to pray. So they didn't pray yet. They were not stirred up. They were not prayed up. We also see that the layman didn't ask for healing. But he just asked for alms, meaning money. He asked for money, and he expected money. And we see in verse 4, and we know that generally when someone wants to pray for sick people, they don't start by saying, look at me. See Peter, what Peter said, look at us. They almost always, the, any minister would say, you have to look at Jesus. You have to look to Jesus. And that's true. Jesus is the source of life and the, and the source of healing. But Peter didn't do that. He didn't say, look at Jesus. He said, look at us. His approach worked while our approach doesn't work. In verse 5, this man was expecting to receive money from Peter and John. There's no indication that he had faith to be healed. He expected money. He didn't even, it didn't even cross his mind to be healed. He didn't expect healing. He didn't have faith for healing. The man didn't have any faith whatsoever. And Peter said, look at us, look at me. That, that might be striking for some of you, but that's, that's the word of God. Let's move on to verse 6. And we, when we minister to the sick, usually we do something like this. Let's pray and see what Jesus would do. Isn't that right? We, we always put it on Jesus. We're afraid to say anything about us or to tell the people, look at us. And when we pray like that, Jesus doesn't do anything. If he does something, he does it out of mercy for you, out of compassion for you, not because of your faith. That's not faith. That kind of prayer doesn't reveal, faith, doesn't reveal faith. And then we say that it must not be his will to heal. If it doesn't happen, nothing happens, since you said, let's see what Jesus would do. If the person doesn't get healed, then it means that it's not God's will for the person to be healed. Isn't that right? But Peter said, look at Peter, what I have, I give you. What I have, I give you. So Peter had something, but not money. Look, look at what Peter gave to the man. He had something. He was conscious that he had healing in the name of Jesus to give. He had no doubt that he could give what he had. Peter had no doubt that he could give what he had healing. Then he doesn't even pray. He just gives a command. Rise up and walk. 
He doesn't pray to Jesus. He doesn't pray to God. He's a, he just tell, tells the person, what I have, I give you. Rise up and walk. That's the prayer of faith. Commanding to seek people to be healed. Be healed in the name of Jesus. Be whole in the name of Jesus. Be cleansed in the name of Jesus. Demons, flee. Uh, I rebuke you. Be gone in the name of Jesus. I cast you out. This is the prayer of faith for a believer. We don't have to beg God or implore God to give us something. He has already given us everything that we need. Healing, power, life. We just need to distribute that life to people. We, just, we have that ministry of reconciliation going to people for God and say, you are reconciled, be healed. You are saved. God, uh, Jesus paid for your sins, paid for your sicknesses, and you can be healed. Verse 7. We see that the man didn't receive strength until, P until Peter pulled him up. He took him by the hand and pulled him up. And boldness comes from knowing what you know and from being completely sure of something. Peter couldn't have pulled him up if he wasn't sure of what he had. He couldn't have had boldness. Remember when I was talking about the difference, I was talking about the difference between boldness, confidence, and pride. P Peter here is not proud. That's not pride. That's boldness. That's faith. That's confidence. And God loves that. He looks for people that have faith. Nobody can please God without faith, the Bible says. Faith is the principal thing. That's what God is looking for. He's looking all over the earth for people that have faith in what he has spoken, what he has said, what he has given to us in Christ. That's amazing. Let me give you an example. If someone comes to me and says, what's your name? I say, I'm Edward. I'm Edward. And the person says, no, 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 you are Bill. And then you tell the person, you're kidding. No, my name is Edward. It's not Bill. It's Edward. How can you be so sure? Do you need to check your ID? Like, are you taking the wallet and check your ID to, to check your name? No. You know that you know that you know that your name is Edward or your name is Andrew or Bill or Peter. You don't doubt your own name. That's the kind of faith that I'm talking about. Where you know that you know that you know that what you have is yours and you can give it to people. You, you don't have any doubt about it. It's a sure thing. In this case here, this lame man shows us also that when you minister healing, you don't necessarily need to touch the afflicted part. Especially when you, as a man, you have to minister to women or the other way around, women ministering to men. You don't need to, uh, to necessarily touch the afflicted part, uh, especially if it's a part that you don't need to touch. It's, it's sufficient to take, uh, to take the person's hands and the life of God flows from you to the other person and heals every afflicted part because life is like electric power. It goes into the person and repels sickness. Amen? And then uh, verse 12, we're dissecting this passage in uh, multiple parts. Verse 12, Peter says, why are you looking, why are you looking at us when, uh, when Peter preaches after he healed the lame, lame person? As if our own power or holiness healed that person. So you don't have to be holy enough or good enough to be able to heal. Peter says it's not our own power. It's not our own godliness or holiness that healed this person. It's faith in the name of Jesus. It wasn't either because they were apostles. Amen? Even apostles, they must believe. This is the condition for healing and power to flow through us. Faith in what God has said in our inheritance, in the word of God. It doesn't matter if you're an apostle or pastor or evangelist or teacher or a simple believer. Everyone, they have something in common. They have a common ministry to believe and to heal the sick. This is a common ministry for everybody. And then verse 16. Who had faith in the name of Jesus in this passage? I said earlier that the lame man didn't even expect. He didn't have faith to be healed. But the one who had faith here is Peter, of course, and not the lame man. So Peter healed that person with his own faith. He gave that person what he had. He didn't pray to God. He didn't pray to Jesus. He didn't say, look at Jesus or let's wait and see what God would do. He said, look at me. 
Look at us, what I have, I give you. Be healed. Simple. Amen. And uh, I think we have time for one more subsection, uh, subsection seven from this uh, second big chapter about God's will on healing. And this one is entitled, Everything Pertaining to Life. And let, I will read the passage from 2 Peter 1, verses 3 to 4, where it says this, As His divine power has given to us all things that pertain to life and godliness, through the knowledge of Him who called us to, by glory and virtue, by which have been given to us exceedingly great and precious promises, that through this you may be partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world through lust. What is this subchapter about? That as a believer, as Christians, as born-again believers, we have received, past tense, we have received everything we need pertaining to life and godliness pertaining to living this life on earth and to being to become to being holy to to do to walk in godliness what is godliness is god likeness we received everything we need to be like god to function like god to do the things that jesus as god did jesus did on the earth we don't need for our song for our prayer oh god come oh uh, come and refresh us come and do this and do that we're waiting we're fasting we're humbling ourselves god is always with us you might not be aware of it but he's always with us we don't need a special revival the fullness of the spirit is with us it says this that we are partakers of the divine nature not only we received everything pertaining to life and godliness but we have the divine nature in us. Yes, we are divine, but not in the way you think that we must receive worship or we are proud or we work. We, work. we are confident. We are humble before our God, but we have his divine nature in us. We have his life in us. Amen. And by his precious promises, how do we become partakers of his divine nature? The divine nature is in us. But how do we partake of that divine nature? How do we benefit or use that divine nature in us? By his promises. How? You take his promises, believe them, put them in you, meditate on them, personalize them until they become part of you. When you eat food, do you see your food in your body? No, the food uh, is digested and it goes to all your cells and you see yourself growing but you don't see where the food has gone. The food becomes part of your body. In the same way, the word of God has to flow through your veins. When someone asks you and you don't have time to think, when you wake up from your sleep, you declare the word of God. Your mindset your, needs to be altered, needs to be changed, renewed, so that you, you assimilate the new identity that you have in Christ. This is not something to joke about. This is not something symbolic. You are someone else. You have a new identity and you need to assimilate that and become one. Assimilate that mind of Christ, that new way of thinking. 2 Corinthians 1 verse 20. This is the last passage I think for the session today. It says this, For all the promises of God in Him are yes, and in Him amen, to the glory of God through us. It says this, it says this, all the promises of God. Not some of promises of God. All the promises of God are yes. What does that mean? Yes, what I promised I want to do for you. What I said in my word, I want to do it for you. Yes and amen. There's no qualification. There's no disclaimer. When we see all kinds of advertisements at uh, a TV or on billboards, always somewhere down there in a small font, it's, there's a disclaimer. Like this is not for certain people this is not for that but that person or for that place or for, uh, not until this period but it's very small so that you won't see it you would see the big but god is not like that he has no disclaimer he said all what i promised is for you it's for anyone anywhere anytime any sickness and it has its yes and amen why it says this to the glory of God through us. So when healing and the promises of God are fulfilled and manifested through us, God is glorified. 
So if God is glorified when the promises and healing is manifested in our life, what happens when we endure sickness and we allow ourselves to be trampled upon by sickness? Is that giving glory to God? No. We're just faithfully enduring, but that's not giving glory to God because that's a work of darkness. So we, the God is glorified by us and by other people when, the, when healing is manifested through us, when the power of God manifests through us, through us and when we work out the promises that God has given us, all the precious promises that God has given us. So we, I think we'll stop here for today. We covered like three subsections, I think, yeah that uh, the first one was anything, anyone, anytime, anywhere. Second was the disciples did the same thing that Jesus did after the cross. And then everything pertaining to life we have already received. Next time we'll continue with uh, two more, I think two more subsections or three. Uh, every spiritual blessing and we'll see what other things, what are other exciting things are waiting for us. Are you excited about this? Do you like this? Do you love the word of God? Until we see you next time, I, I pray that God will bless you and enrich you and uh, grant you to, to be able to release more and more of His power, of His healing to yourself, to your family, to your friends, to, and to all people around you. In the name of Jesus, amen.